Welcome to They Are Waiting For Us from Forbes Books, the podcast that explores how education can transform lives and communities, featuring conversations with change agents who are making a difference in education, from parents and advocates to teachers and leaders. Here's Dr. Lisa Andrew. Well, hello, and welcome to my first podcast, They Are Waiting For Us. I'm really excited to spend time with all of you and to share thoughts about today's educational system, the way that we can support it, and the way that we can support the change that needs to happen so that all students can have access and opportunity to a bright future. My very first guest today is a leader who's dedicated his career to transforming some of the most challenged schools and districts in the country. Dr. Derek Mitchell is the CEO of Partners in School Innovation, an organization that helps educators build their capacity to serve students from historically marginalized communities. He is a visionary, a strategist, a collaborator, and a learner. Derek, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Lisa. Really, really, really pleased to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here as well. So let's first start with, when did you know you wanted a career in education? I think very, very early in my childhood, it was clear that I was hyperverbal. I would agree with that with what I know about you. <laughs> and my uh, my mom thought I would be a teacher or a preacher. And so I uh, I kind of started along the preacher angle, but quickly got a bit disoriented and, and uh, disappointed by how much what they say doesn't match what they do and pivoted early to the teacher space. My mom claims that, that uh, I was always going to be a teacher. Once I started school, my uh, elementary school teacher changed my name and I came home calling myself something different. Oh, goodness. Uh, and she said, Derek, what are you doing? Your name's not Roderick, it's Derek. You know, and I told her the teachers thought that Derek was short for Roderick and I figured she's the teacher so she would know. So somebody may not have told me my full name was Roderick. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting about identity, you know, yeah, identity, how you people know. want to project onto you, right? That's right. But she said that, uh, you know, the fact that I cared so much and believed so much in what teachers did, even as I was starting in school, she knew I would be in a, a teacher in the education work. Great. So I think we both kind of have the same uh, blood going through our veins a bit here. And one of the reasons I get up in the morning is the belief that we are preparing the students of Silicon Valley to become the workforce of Silicon Valley. How did your experience in software development inform your approach to education reform? I got into software development in education specifically because I was a poorly prepared teacher for the diversity of kids' needs um, in my classroom. I was really good with the students who were right in that center place, ready to learn and motivated, but I didn't have anything for the students who were you know, barely able to read or for the kids who knew more about English and history than I did. Right, right. Um, and I thought software would be able to help me understand and, uh, and accumulate more information about what the kids need ahead of the t ahead of instructional time, so that I can take those needs into account and kind of design some better uh, processes. And so, the the most important contribution I think in my education around technology was really about assessments, the the ability of of just in time dipstick measures that teachers can use with students to really get a sense of how much do they know before you begin an instruction around the content and maybe to check their understanding as they, uh, as they leave the room. Really good use of the, those kind of measures enabled me to improve my instruction uh, dramatically, but there were real gaps too in the technology. So most of the content was not culturally respectful. And so there was need to correct um, some pieces that do that. And many other tools that were built on, you know, kind of the old mental models of norming against, you know, essentially white men made it pretty clear that there was a little bit of a bias embedded in some of the uh, material sets. And so uh, developing new assessment structures that actually tapped and leveraged what kids brought from their cultures, from their families into the work, and then informed teachers to strengthen their, their grounding in that work was really what I was excited about in the ed tech world. Yeah. I love this, the, the idea that you're sharing about a software tool 
really enhancing the art of teaching and really wanting to start where students are at so that uh, you can serve all students, right? right. And, and making right. sure that tools can help with that, but still the need for that human touch to know where to go with the student and, and how to go. So that's that's great. There's a lot, a lot of tropes about uh, the educational enterprise that typically aren't true, and they've really never been true, but they've never really, never really been investigated or interrogated. And one of them is that every kid is ready at the same levels at the same time, just because they're in third grade, um, that, they, that, you know, they're all ready to learn fourth grade. And that's almost never true. And so to create tools that enable teachers to be more adaptive and responsive to the kids they currently have, as opposed to this little model that that we're all holding that every kid moves at the same rate and is ready at the same time. Those are just nonsensical beliefs. I think it's interesting that as an adult, you know, when I enter into a space and if I'm learning something new, it's like, okay, I expect the instructor to help me meet me where I'm at and make sure that I learn what I want to learn. You know, whether I'm, you know, learning a new computer system or I'm learning how to, I went to a new boba shop yesterday and they had this whole new system of how you didn't walk up in order. They had all these computers and and the screens. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have no idea what's happening here. I expected them to come out and meet me where I was at. Right. And the gal behind the counter, you know, looked at me like, what's wrong with you? Like, there's the screen. You go up to the screen. You're supposed to know what to do on the screen. So, yeah, as adults, we have this natural, hey, come help me. Meet me where I'm at. Help me so that I can be successful in this environment. And so it shouldn't be surprising that the student should and want the same thing and that that should be provided. So I know that at Partners, you introduced a notion that continuously improving an unfair system isn't enough. That continuous school improvement needed to have a racial equity lens. So I'm curious, how did you come to that realization? Uh, one of the ways is in looking at the state assessment data systems that many of our district clients are are struggling to succeed against. It was fairly clear early on that we could help all our schools make progressively incremental results against those systems, but that to do transformation work, the systems themselves needed to change. They needed to be more culturally respectful. They needed to be more adaptive to how kids learn and how they demonstrate knowledge. Essentially, we're prioritizing just one way of knowing and reflecting what we know in those systems. And uh, humankind is more diverse than that. And the assumption is that, you know, if a student can't demonstrate in that particular methodology, then there's something wrong with them that they're not ready, that they don't know, that they can't achieve. And, and you and I know from our experience that that's never true. There's, there are lots of ways you can get at what students know. Um, and so making incremental improvements against a, a system that uh, has built-in biases against kids who don't have a lot of money at home or kids who speak a language other than English or, or, or kids who are recent immigrants or you know kids who are African-American. Making incremental improvements um, in those systems is good because each one means some kids are better able to read and to to to, to achieve. Um, but but our aspiration is for all kids to be able to achieve every single one, right? The the stubborn one, the mean one, the 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 violent one, the one whose parents are are totally disconnected. Um, uh, the kid who's homeless. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Our, our aspirations for every single one of them to have a transformational, powerful educational experience so that they can reach their potential. If that is true, and if that's really what we're, we're about, then our systems can't only prioritize one way of demonstrating knowledge. They have to be more responsive, adaptive, uh, diverse than that. And so at Partners, we work really hard to help our schools and, and district partners understand the need for more robust and uh, responsible and responsive way of knowing. Yeah. Um, and that's in all content areas, right? Um, you know, the research is clear about, you know, project-based learning and having students demonstrate what they know rather than just regurgitate it. Those kind of strategies take more time, more attention, more training for teachers. 
And frankly, it's easier to just, you know, put a ditto sheet in front of kids um, and uh, and expect them to kind of figure it all out. Yes. But we got to get away from the easy, you know, put, hitting the easy button on instruction because, you know, kids are more powerful, more adaptive, more capable than what those ways of, of expressing can capture. Yes. So in that vein, due to our STEM equity focus here at the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, we were very interested in the adoption of the new California math framework by the State Board of Education last week. So the new framework claims to have an equity-focused approach and stresses no tracking. And it it really goes into the things that you were just talking about. More than one way to get at something. Students bring different lived experiences and different capital to the classroom. So how can we tap into that to help them to learn new concepts? So how does this adoption align or maybe doesn't align with your continuous school improvement approach? One thing that makes partners a little unusual for uh, reform support organizations is that we don't choose for our partnerships what they prioritize, right? They do. Um, And that's because we don't believe you can build leadership by making people followers, by taking from them the choices that they have to make and live with. Right. Part of the the challenge in, in having an approach that's essentially content agnostic is that we lean into the way in which we do things, the intentionality in which we execute, implement, adopt, deliver, uh, assess, and reflect. Our district clients are finding those new standards very challenging to implement and execute from a bunch of perspectives. From one perspective, the whole question of where algebra rests has become a huge challenge and, and storm of, of, of conflict where, you know, some families feel like it should be in, really threaded all the way through the instructional space, but, you know, concentrated um, in seventh and eighth grade so that, you know, kids are more likely to be able to get access to the higher level math coursework in high school. Others feel like you're setting kids up to fail if they haven't been able to be properly prepared um, for those courses at that point in time. And so it should be really threaded all, you know, into the high school experience. And the state curriculum is pretty clear about it. And so helping our helping our clients think about this conundrum in a way that that allows them to be appropriately compliant with what the expectations of the state are, but that adapts to where their kids' needs are so that they can accelerate where they need to and build greater capacity of their teaching force to teach adaptively and responsibly. It's a really, um, every curricular adoption, every adoption of a set of standards um, creates the same sort of spin, right? The same question of how does this match with what we're currently doing and what do teachers need to know differently in order to do this better? And, you know, and how do we know this is better than what we've had before? When you talk to master teachers, they'll, you know, lean back and cross their arms and say this to a pass. You know, we've gone through this six times now. And as, and so we know what kids really need to know. And we're going to kind of do what we think they really need to know. But you and I know that students haven't been superlatively successful. At least not the students we're organized to help districts serve. Um, those who are challenged by poverty and and uh, and intergenerational racism. And so we we keep front of mind that something needs to be better in order for the kids to be better served. And maybe this adoption is an opportunity to reflect more powerfully about how to better serve students where they are. And that's generally where my where my staff takes the work. So in your educational experience, when you were in school, were you trapped? Did you or did you have access? What was what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I, I was tracked in a number of different ways. Just to lay it out there, I am not for tracking. I think tracking locks kids into and out of different opportunities. And I say into because if you're tracked into the, you know, the sort of achieving <laughs> core, you know, you uh, you generally meet with better academic outcomes. The challenge with 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 tracking is that it 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 locks kids into a particular frame that may or may not be right for them. And it assumes effort is less important than ability. All of our experience in education suggests the opposite. 
my experience is really unusual and it's integrated with racism. So be prepared on that front. Um, so er, my early education experience all the way through third grade was in a, a school near the suburb of Chicago um, that still had white people in it. So you, you might remember that there was a period of time when white people were kind of fleeing the, the urban centers. And uh, because this neighborhood is near the suburbs, um, it still had you know, sort of mixed um, families in it. And the school was Francis Scott Key was the name of it. And um, and it was a really high performing elementary school, very diverse, very effective teaching and really nice and inclusive experience. I even remember being Louis Armstrong in the school play. First time I saw a real trumpet. Um, wow. And But we moved and moved into a, a neighborhood that I like to describe as a 120 percent black in Chicago's West Side uh, and went to a new school middle of my third grade year. Um, this place called Robert Emmett Elementary. And Emmett was pretty much the opposite. You know, all black students, mostly white teachers, uh, which means they're driving pretty far to come to teach here, which is an interesting question on its own, right? I've been there about a month before the, the my experience with standardized testing starts. My very first uh, sitting down for the hour test of basic skills. I don't know if you remember that, ICBS. Right. And I had never taken a standardized test before. I didn't even know what to do. And I'm sitting there, you know, trying to figure out what all this is about. I can be at the Boba machine. Exactly. And I missed the training. They had done a training earlier in the year and I had missed it. So I, I basically screwed up the first um, sheet by bubbling in and making diagrams. And cause I think it was a puzzle of some kind. And yeah. The rock comes around and is like, what are you doing? No, 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 no. He gets a blank sheet, he brings it and lifts it up and goes, oh, there's a worksheet with questions under there. Yeah. So I took this test and the, several months later, the results come back and I had tested seventh grade proficiency at third grade, according to the, to wow. the ITBS. What the school interpreted that to me was that I was ready for seventh grade work. <laughs> Not even close to what that means. Right. Right. Um, uh, that that meant that if a seventh grader took the third grader's test, that's how how the person would perform. Anyway, the school then started bouncing me around trying to find a class to challenge me. I ended up landing in an eighth grade classroom where I got you know beat up just about every day. Yeah. Um, and forced to do other people's homework, and then eventually, you know, the principal took pity on me and put me in a classroom that was an overflow classroom with a mixture of, of sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders. And I was in that classroom for the next four years. Wow. With the same teacher for the three of those four years. And I have to say, she was consistent in her inability to teach. <laughs> she had one of those panophones that opened up and she had the lessons for every week in sequence. And that's what she did. Week one lessons, week two lessons, week three lessons. And so by the time I was in her classroom for my third year, I was taking tests from memory. Like, what hey. were the fourth week's words? Hmm, to spelling. I was writing down on my way to school, um, selling, you know, the answers to my to my uh, classmates. Classmates changed every year, but I didn't. So it was me and this teacher, you know, pretty much each of those years. Yeah. Um, but the school believed I was smart. And so, uh, in addition to the work in that class, the principal would sign me up for other things, you know, science fairs. I started the first school newspaper. Um, I was interested in photography. So she uh, had the photographer down the street uh, apprentice me for a while. And so I was getting all this extra attention and uh, basically following my own questions, you know, my, my own, my own uh, inquiry. And, and I, to this day, feel like um, what the what the principal did for me is something that should have been done for every kid that was there. It's interesting because you have this you have this dichotomy going right. You have this tracking, acceleration, enrichment, meeting somebody meeting you where you're at, going to your interests. Someone saying, "No, this is what I do. I'm just going to repeat, repeat. You know, rinse, wash, repeat." It's like you had all of these things at play with folks just trying to figure out. How do we meet the student where they're at? How do we ensure that a third grade chronological, but academically seventh grade, who even knows where you were emotionally and socially, 
Right. Um, and just, you know, what do we do with the student in order to, um, and it sounds like there's like just a mix that happened to you of. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to me, what, what I learned from that experience is the power of these assessments. Yeah. Yes. I yes. mean, to shape the life of a kid. I mean, maybe I, I answered those bubbles randomly. Who knows? I mean, I can't tell you what I did with them, but the but whatever I did, that changed the course of my life. Right. Because right. the principal had a different perspective about what I was capable of and would spend extra time, energy, and effort making sure um, that my curiosity and my questions and the things I wanted to learn, and I had opportunities that other kids didn't have. Right. Uh, of course, socially, I became the principal's pet. Right. And ended up with, you know, getting a lot of uh, blowback from my peers yeah. around. Um, yeah. But 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 it ended up working for me because that, that final year, a new teacher came in. Uh, the teacher, you know, who I was telling you about, she, she left after having a nervous breakdown one day and didn't come back. And a new teacher, this guy named David Canapa, came in. And he was trained by Operation Push for Excellence in Chicago the summer before. Mm -hmm. And he was tremendous. Yeah. He he brought us our, our very first novels to read. We hadn't read novels up until that point. We had his, history textbooks from the 1950s, and this was late 70s. He thought that was the craziest thing ever. So it, what do you realize how much has changed, you know, in history at that amount of time? Right. So we started right. reading books. Um, about that history to kind of understand things. And it it, it changed the course of my life. He yeah. also was the one who suggested that I take this, uh, another assessment called the S SSAT test, which was the secondary school admissions test, uh, which is like the SAT, but for private schools, for high school. And uh, I did, I took that test and scored well again. And, you know, before too long, scholarship offers started um, for the private school system, you know, the prep schools. Uh, most of which on the East Coast, um, and so and so. Anyway, the the power of, of testing to to shape kids' lives right uh, was very compelling to me, and it's been a a real uh, a real lesson that has reasserted itself for me all throughout my career. I would imagine that, and what your experience was, and how it shaped you as now you know, a leader of an organization that's trying to influence and help others change and shape their systems to meet every student where they need to be met at and provide what they need to be provided in order to succeed. Right, right. On that note, we're going to switch gears, but we have to take a break first. Coming up in the second part of my discussion with Dr. Derek Mitchell, the CEO of Partners in School Innovation, Derek shares some of the biggest issues we need to tackle as a society. I think our schools need to be a great deal more reflective of the values of the communities around them. And until we do that, school feels colonial. This has been They Are Waiting For Us. If you want to learn how to create economic opportunity through equal access to quality education and create an extraordinary learning environment focused on everyone realizing their full potential, go to drlisaandrew.com. They Are Waiting For Us is a production of Forbes Books.